Ani kinawea, me haini njini kaz, anji nang dunje ba. Bonjour, ani enda noe maga nag, kije mane do ja wene mishin, nido kueshin, jigo ya kobi mosion no ma king. Hello everyone, my name is Mei Hai. Uh, I am from a place called Sarnia, which is in Ontario, and I work for Virginia Tech. Um, oh, this is, uh, I asked the, our relatives around us to help me with a straight path today, because <laughs> there's a lot of stuff in my head all the time, and I, I have a hard time getting it out in a way other people can understand. And a lot of my education was centered on that, was being able to, to talk about multi-dimensional things to people who are not from oh, a similar worldview. Um, so I am so grateful um, to be here uh, to share ideas that I've been sort of cooking up for a long time, I guess. And, and, but they're, they're not my ideas alone. They're from the ancestors. Um, I'm thankful to be with other um, Ogichi dog or protectors of the minds of our children and our lands. Um, I'm also thankful to the Lummi people for co-evolving in such a gentle way with this place to make it a place that so many other people can fall in love with. And it's my hope today to carry on that tradition of co-evolutionary excellence in what I hope to contribute and share with you all. Um, so uh, I was talking with Michelle earlier today, so thankful to meet her and my brothers here. Uh, people help me sort of say these things out loud, but <laughs> practice my my talk and I was, I used to work for the Park Service. I was a geologist also um, and uh, I, I, they made me the education specialist and so I used to hang out with non-geologists doing all kinds of things so I could prepare place-based educational experiences for kids in uh, the San Francisco area. And um, uh, one thing we used to do is we used to gather these beautiful seeds called buckeyes and uh, I used to gather chestnuts when I was a kid, and I, I would have pockets full of them. I just thought they were magical, the way they were so brown and shiny and everything. And so we would gather these buckeyes in uh, the Mirror Woods. And um, the lady I worked with was a biologist, and she said, okay, now what we need to do is we need to trick these seeds into thinking a year goes by so that we can start growing them in the greenhouse. And so she goes, let me tell you what a seed goes through. It um, comes out of a tree, so it bumps along the ground, and then maybe a little animal gnaws on it a little bit. Maybe it rolls along the ground and gets scratched up, and then it gets cold, and then it gets wet, and it goes through all these traumatic things to create sort of openings in it so that other nutrients can come in. And so part of my job right now working for Virginia Tech, I get to, to connect with um, all kinds of beautiful native people and get to hear their stories and spend time and so many of us have bumped along like these buckeye seeds um little cracks in us all over the place but but these are vortexes of excellence right nutrients have gotten in and so what happens with these seeds once and, and also when the seed finally settles into its situation it doesn't matter how it's oriented there is a powerful root that comes out of it and starts it growing towards the energy it needs to draw in new resources. It, it starts it growing in the direction of light. And that powerful root continues to grow roots and spread throughout its lifetime. And that little seed and that powerful root reaches into a, a world it hasn't known. It started in the ground. Well, actually, it started in the tree. <laughs> then it went into the ground. Now it's going into another world. And, and that little seed has to simultaneously um, grow in two worlds. It has to grow in the ground, and it has to grow in the sunlight and the air. And it has to draw resources from both to survive and thrive. And the funny thing is about it, it doesn't matter if it's a buckeye or a bean, or there's so many little baby plants, and they all pop out with these two little sort of heart-shaped leaves that look the same, and I think they're called cotyledons. They're not even their leaves. So everything that this seed has is gifted to it from its ancestors. And then eventually, once it's in this new environment, it grows this true leaf, this little bit of something that allows you to identify it. And so I was thinking on this, this and it's, it's at that point then 
that it can start drawing in resources to store for the next generation. Um, so thinking of this, um, um, this is kind of what I do. <laughs> I, I was looking at the title of what I, <laughs> what am I doing? Okay, so I, I put uh, a wellness framework. Okay, some people call those medicine wheels. So in Anishinaabe when medicine is the word mashkiki, which is, I'm very curious about word pieces. Uh, that is like a compound word uh, from mashkiwazi and aki, which means strength drawn from the earth. So I'm thinking, we're not so different <laughs> from these seeds in many, many ways. So when I think of a medicine wheel, I think of a framework for evoking excellence. How do, how do we evoke that strength, that, that inner root that's going to really kickstart this process? So just like with the Buckeye, how do we kickstart this process? Um, and the reason for this is, myself included, and, and I, I really, I'm only ever speaking from my own experience. I didn't think I had a voice. I didn't think I had anything to say. I didn't think I knew anything of value to anyone else. And I think a lot of us feel like that way for a long time. And, and I wish that wasn't the way. I wish we popped into the world like knowing we were gonna do big things and we had important stuff. And without that confidence in that knowledge, we don't share it. And then we don't know how to fix like we're, we have sort of scientific ideas being dispensed at us from places that are not here. Like I was telling my brother this morning about like what temperature water boils at. I used to ask my students this. They would say 100 degrees Celsius. And I, I was like, how do you know that? And it was like words from words from words from where, where did the words come from? Let's try it. It's not 100 degrees <laughs> because there's all kinds of other local variables that mess with that, right? So we should be going from local knowledge to, to whatever that source is, rather than the other way around. So knowledge is being lost. We need to empower our youth to share what they know much, much sooner. So again, I, I created this, this, I mean, if you've had a chance to talk with me, I need frameworks to like be my best person. And I, I was sharing with my brother this morning about my nephew to put on his shoes. He says, Nana says, pull out the, oh no, open the Velcro, pull out the tongue, put in your shoe, close the Velcro. Like we need these procedures until we just do it as habit. Okay, so, so I, um, I think also, we, so we need a framework. It needs to be open-ended because the only thing that's constant is change, right? Um, so we need to have questions asked of ourselves and of teachers. And then um, I also really like frameworks that evoke time being spent sharing stories. And then the last thing is that it needs to be modeled after nature. So as a teacher, I try to imagine like my pregame is like the winter. Like I haven't met anybody yet, I'm stuck inside, um, I'm learning about them, I'm thinking about how I'm gonna organize everything. And then I go into spring and I start to see the light being shed on the context and I start to dabble in it a little bit. Then we have a little season of doing work and then we move into celebrating, um, uh, harvesting, reflecting, things like that. Um, so, I used to teach uh, for five years when I was working on my doctorate, I taught scientists to be teachers. And most of the reason for that was that in the trajectory of science, you go from playing science. And my nephews ask me, they go, hey, Dr. Neat, do you wanna play science? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> I love to play science. So we have like our little like social thing where we got ice cube trays and colors and things like that. And then you follow that, that kid and they're competing for like graduate positions in labs and, and then it's, they're all alone. And they go into these fields to learn their place in a, a vast universe of stories and they end up being in their spaces alone with no one to talk with. Um, except the phenomenon, <laughs> you know, and, and they don't talk much in English. Um, so, uh, so I would teach these scientists to be science teachers because they would be looking for a place to share their stories. And so in a two-year master's program, they would learn uh, one of the quadrants, I believe, of this, this uh, framework. And I don't think they thought of it like this, but I think of it like this. And that is honoring people as natural learners. OK, 
okay? You are learning machines. That's what your brain does. That's how we have co-evolved with these landscapes successfully for so long. Um, so how do you do that? They learn this thing called a 5E. They learn to engage, explore, explain, elaborate, and evaluate. They also learn how to manage their classroom through like, I would call it sustained play, like keeping the kids interested in things, um, behavior support, um, also like things like where do you put the materials so everybody's not falling over each other, things like that. And then also they, they look at assessment, like is it aligned with standards because our kids will meet certain gateways that will present challenges and if they can't get through them, they, they might get stuck. Um, and then also is it authentic? Okay, so they leave and they go out into the world, they're teachers. And I'm thankful for that because a lot of places I've visited in the United States don't have teachers. They have people that take a six week course and they are thrust into the <laughs> teaching universe to you know, burn alive or, <laughs> or do awesome. Um, so I thought, you know, I, and I did this with my students. I was like, they would, they would call me in the morning and they would say, this is gonna be the best lesson ever. And then they would call me in the afternoon and they'd be crying. And I would say, there's something I think we can do. So we would take that same lesson that they had the 5E and the management and the assessment all loaded into. And then I said, how did you honor people as physical beings? Did you get it in the intellectual sweet spot where it was not so easy, it was boring, and not so hard, it was frustrating? Did you make it physical? Was it really about them? And did you let them move around? People are wigglers. Right? They, they got to move. Um, did you make it social? And did people smile and laugh, or did they cry, or did they feel something? Science is exciting. It should, we go to science museums to be like, oh, you know, <laughs> that's, those are the things we're drawn to. Then, did you honor them as unique contributors to building the capacity of their community? Everybody carries around a medicine to heal. This world is, that was, one of the elders said that yesterday, this world is a mess, it's unbalanced. We each carry something unique to heal it. Did you let them do it? Did they create something today that they couldn't have made yesterday and they're not gonna make tomorrow? Like a little fingerprint of their, their, their self in the world. Um, did, did you teach them to follow critical thinking protocols where they observe, uh, analyze, infer, and then ask new questions? Um, did you engage them with their community to build the capacity of it right now and not at some imaginary point in the future? Okay, and then the last quadrant is um, Honoring the empowerment through fulfillment of a unique human niche. Okay, so did you have them contribute? And I, I made a list of things like, these are things, I don't care what you're teaching a kid. Like, I don't even teach science right now. <laughs> I teach something else, but I teach the same thing every time. And I, I check through whatever they say I'm supposed to be teaching, and I, I check for things like this. Like, did I teach kids about community and kinship and about rem remembering relatedness? Did I teach them about actions done with others rather than to them or for them, including our natural relatives? Um, did I teach them of reciprocity or the responsibility of reciprocity? Did I teach them about closed systems that we circulate through our earth home? Like we're not going anywhere. <laughs> we'll always be being here in some way, shape, or form. Did, was it holistic? Um, uh, did it honor place? Did it engage cyclical time uh, understanding? Uh, was it about balance and regeneration, journey and process, and was it about long-term decision making, like seven generations backwards and forwards? So I kind of worked on that, that's, but that's only covering four quadrants. And was Brian who told me that, that this is a fabulous conference, and he's totally right, and I thought I need to add something new <laughs> that I've been working on, because you know, in case he's heard me talk about this before because this is sort of what I do. Um, I was like, there's more directions. Because I um, was telling my brother this morning also, um, I have, uh, I train horses mostly. <laughs> more than being an academic probably. Um, and when I, when I sit on a horse, my, my, well, I, there was times in my life when I didn't want to have a horse. And my mom said, you'll always have a horse because that's how you talk with your ancestors. And I didn't know what she meant. And, and she's absolutely right. When I have the biggest problem in the world, I can't sleep, I can't do anything, I sit on my horse, problem solved. I can get at my inner, my inner fire, and I know what I'm supposed to do. I can evoke that root that pushes me into a new space, allows me to draw in new nutrients. So what is that about? That's about the four legs of the horse for the four directions, 
but it's also about growing up, honoring the earth. When you get those six directions together, that's when you get at your inner fire. So to add to this model then, I would ask teachers, how are you honoring the air and the medium you share with other people to find relatedness? How are you honoring the earth as the primary instructor? And then how does that evoke the ancestors to, to bring out this powerful root? Um, and these would be easy questions. Like, this sounds all like philosophical and whatever. I used to ask teachers this. I used to say, how will you honor people as learners? Okay. Next direction, how will you honor people as physical beings? Um, how, will you, how will learners be honored as active contributors to their community? And, and as sense makers, teachers come up with answers to this. Um, how will the learners develop empowerment through reflection on uh, the necessary role they play in the community? And that's why so many of our young people are lost, is they don't know how necessary they are and how, how necessary their contribution is. Um, how will the words and exchanges be honored as a medium for finding relatedness? How, and my nephew will be the first one to tell you, like, lower your voice. <laughs> Those are not kind words. You know, they're making me feel bad. Um, how will the earth be honored and assisted in being the primary instructor? And I had to remind my teachers of that uh, a lot, that when we become teachers, we think that we're in charge of things. And if you've ever gone on a field trip and there has been a bee that showed up, you're not in charge. <laughs> There is a greater context always at play. You know, all you can do is make sure you have a backpack full of stuff ready to troubleshoot um, so, that, so that nature can teach. Um, and then the last one is how will the acknowledging of the ancestors be encouraged for remembering the stories necessary for forward movement? And all that said, so now we've made a, a dimensional ball. That starts rolling, okay? And that's what rolls towards vision what we're imagining. And so this last question is, how will unity be honored for the restoration of balance and harmony? And um, that's all I got. <laughs>